Hey everybody, Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata and today we're going to be talking about CAN bus systems, which half of you are probably going, oh no, I need to get out of here. And the other half are going, oh, this could be interesting. So bear with me, we'll get to some interesting stuff. What is CAN bus? There's a lot of misunderstanding about what this thing is. It's in Miatas, it's in Miata, every Miata since 2006. Sorry, NA and MB owners, you don't have this toy. But a lot of people don't understand what it is. And fundamentally, to make it grossly oversimplified, it's internet in your car. Not internet in terms of you can go surf the web on there, but it's the way that all the different th parts of your car can talk to each other. It's a network designed specifically for use in vehicles. It's a controller area network, that's what it stands for. So the, the CAN bus, the, the controller area network, is there to allow the different parts of a modern car to talk to each other. It's actually a, a standard, it's been around for a very, very long time. Now the important thing to know about it is it's not a standard as to what the content of the messages is. It simply defines what the messages look like. It starts off with an address, you know, that tells you what this message is, an ID number, and then it's broken down into how, you know, how many bytes it are identified. And there's various checksums and things in there. But basically that's all it is. It's basically just this is what a message looks like. So it doesn't tell you what the information is going to be on the system. It doesn't tell you that when the powertrain control module is talking to the dynamic stability control module, this is exactly what the message will look like. It simply says, this is how the message gets from here to there. And it's sort of a broadcast network, so it's interesting. It's not, the messages are not sent from point to point necessarily. They are broadcast over the entire network so that the entire network can use that information. For example, in this ND I'm sitting on here, um, it has electric power steering electrically, electric power system, whatever, electric power steering. And there's sensors in that power steering that say how hard the person behind the wheel is, is reefing on the wheel and the angle of the steering wheel. And things like that angle of the steering wheel is used by uh, the tire pressure monitoring system, which uses it in a very clever way on this particular car. It's used by lane departure. It's used, um, I don't think the turn indicators use it at all. Uh, it's used by stability control, obviously, because you need to know where the wheels are pointing. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's possibly even used by the powertrain control module to say, you know, I need a little more electrical power because someone is really trying to turn the wheel at a standstill, so alternator, get ready. Um, and that's all because this information is just being broadcast out over the network. Same thing with, say, the reverse sensor on the transmission. Um, when you put the car into reverse, the, uh, the body can, the powertrain control module, I believe, sends out a message saying, hey, car's in reverse, and things like the power hardtop on the RF now know that the car is in reverse and so don't lower the top when the car is in reverse um, because you know you can back into somebody you can't see where you're going. So these messages are shared through the entire car and it makes the whole car into a connected platform which lets you do very very cool stuff such as figuring out if the tire pressure is good using nothing more than wheel speed sensors and steering wheel angle. It took us a while to, retro to figure out what the heck was going on with that one I'll tell you. So. I'll show you, actually, I'll, let's give you something to look at. Um, I'm plugged into this car. It's turned off right now. But here is what is actually going on. Come on. Oh, they know, don't they? They always know. You're sleeping. Am I plugged in? How do they do this to me? Hmm. Well, let's power the car up and see what happens. There we go. They'd have gone completely to sleep. Usually when these cars are, are sleeping, there's a little bit of activity going on all the time, but this one had completely set herself down. So this is the traffic on the CAN network. And this has been, this has been simplified a little bit. Um, this particular one is saying, okay, here's what the message ID number is. And say, uh, you know, the transmission might always send out its information on message 202. Um, it's eight bits long, and those are what those eight bits are in hexadecimal. And then this is telling me how quickly it's updating. So this particular message here is updating every 500 milliseconds. So it's not a very important message. That could be something like engine coolant temperature, which doesn't change very fast. Some of these messages are really whipping by. You can see these ones are going every 10 milliseconds. So that is more likely to be something with the steering or the stability control or something that needs to be updated very often. Um, and you can, we can log these. We can, uh, we can analyze them. You can export this to a a spreadsheet, you can do all sorts of stuff with it, but this is basically, this is the traffic on the network, and we're just listening. We're not sending any of this right now, um, but I can. Let's, let's do the little send thing. So if I 
click this, I'm going to send a message that will trigger the warning chime. There we go. I'll turn that off again. So that was me just throwing a little bit of extra, throwing a message into the, into the system saying, make the ding. Uh, we tried a few different things. I mean, I could send something like a tachometer signal, but the problem is there's, the car is already sending tachometer signals saying the engine's not running. So if I send out one that says, hey, it's at 6,000 RPM, by the time the car has a chance to do anything about that, it will have received six or seven others that say, it's not at 6,000 RPM, don't be goofy. But an engine, a, a ding, we can make a ding happen anytime. So if you want to do what I'm doing here, and let me just shut this down, and listen to what's going on in the CAN system, there's actually a bunch of fairly accessible tools to do this with. I've got a couple of them sitting on here. Now this is this is a PCAN interface that's designed specifically for this sort of thing. Um, very, very nice little piece of kit. But if you watch some of my other videos where I've been playing with my analog race dash, I'm using the CAN system to extract things like speedometer information, like, um, like the tachometer, engine temperature, that sort of thing. So that whole thing is being run off this little microcontroller, which can be Arduino, it can be CircuitPython, whatever. But this thing has CAN bus built into it. So I just plug CAN into that. It can see the messages, it can read the, read the messages, and it can do things in reaction. It can also transmit messages if it wants to. So it could make that thing bing nonstop. Which brings up the potential for all sorts of abuse. If we wanted to make this thing make a binging noise at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every second Tuesday, this is how you, would, you could do it that way. Um, good luck trying to figure that one out. And we have some other ones in here too. This is one that sits on top of a, on top of a Raspberry Pi, for example. This is a smaller, cheaper one that sits. This one has a power supply built in. It's more complex. This is a smaller, cheaper one that sits on top of a Pi. And this is the absolute minimum. This is basically the chip that does the translation and the uh, transmission. And then you just hook that up and send your binary information down there. So this is as simple as it needs to be. So if you, see, you know it's for CAN because it says so on the bottom. Um, yeah, some of these are off uh, places like Adafruit. Um, SparkFun has this kind of stuff. You can get it from Amazon, although I recommend places like Adafruit or SparkFun because they have actual support as opposed to some random schmuck on Amazon. Um, so that's how you can get into it. So there's, there's an important thing to understand. Because the way this network is set up, you can't replace a message unless you're physically interrupting the network. And so that's the difference between something like this little thing, which is a effectively one of these built into a relay. It's a little smart relay. It can listen to the CAN traffic and it can do something in response to the CAN traffic. I think it can transmit as well. But this basically just, it sits on the side of the network. It listens, listens, listens. It can, you know, relay, turn its little relays on and off depending on what it wants to do. Um, but it doesn't intercept anything. It doesn't change things. That's where you need something like a gateway. That's what this is. This thing intercepts signals come in. <laughs> I've been, I was taking it apart to play with it. There we go. Um, Got to stop leaning on that. This little guy sits in the middle of a CAN network. So, for example, the messages, the signals come in here, and then this thing will decide if a particular message should be allowed through, in which case it'll transmit it again, or whether it should be modified, in which case it'll take it and swap out a couple of bytes, make it do what it wants to do, or it might just block it completely. So this is the sort of thing that we use. This is famously a V8 Miata, which is running a GM ECU, a GM engine, and a hydraulic power steering rack. Um, this is how we get all that stuff to talk to the Mazda. This does the translation. It takes a GM signal. It modifies it, sends it out in Mazda speak. Um, it takes Mazda signals, mostly the factory PCM, screaming in the dark, saying, I don't know what's going on. My engine is gone. Um, and it blocks those and just sends reassuring GM messages along in a, mess, in a uh, way that the, that the Mazda can understand it. So how do you know? Well, before I go, before this. So when you see a lot of these little devices and boxes that want to change the way your car works, such as turning on the daytime running lights when the headlights are on, for example, there's two ways you can do that. One is you can intercept the signal between that's probably the electrical switching module and the body control module that says headlights are on, turn off the daytime running lights. Um, so you can intercept that and change it to headlights aren't on or headlights are on and keep the daytime running lights on. So you modify that signal or you simply spam the network with something else. You yell louder than the other guy in the room 
and just say, DRL's on, determining that's on, 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 on. And that can be a problem because it doesn't always work. In fact, I think I can demonstrate that. Let me turn this back on again. Let's see if I left this turned on. I think I did. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that the check engine light is on. And you can see it's flickering. And the reason it's doing that is because I'm sending a message saying the light's on, and then the car is sending a message saying the light's off. And it's mostly on because I'm sending it every 10 milliseconds. Um, but really, it's not a very clever way. I turned it off again. It's not a very clever way to get it done. It's just yelling. But unfortunately, it's a fairly common way because it's easy. That's the sort of thing you could do with something simple like this. You could do with something simple like this. Um, but ideally, you need to interrupt the signal. And you have to watch out when you're doing that because even if you're letting the signals come in and sending them straight back out again, there's a very slight delay. And on certain critical signals, um, that can be enough to throw things into an error mode if they're not arriving exactly when they should. We had trouble with this particular conversion um, because of where we had this placed. It was between the body control module, sorry, the dynamic stability control module and the powertrain control module which have to talk to each other very, very rapidly so that the engine can cut the throttle if the dynamic stability control wants it to, for example. And the very, very slight delay that this thing was introducing into those signals would occasionally trigger an ABS failure, which proved to be very difficult to track down until we, well, it was, it was quite, a, I can go on for a long time about that particular story, but let's just say it was very difficult. So you have to watch the messages you're messing with if you are going to intercept them and modify them. Um, these little toys are from a company called MRS um, that we have worked with. They do uh, industrial, industrial levels of stuff, um, and we worked with one of their employees at the time who, uh, who was very interested in our project and gave us a lot of help. Um, unfortunately, the programming software for these is, is relatively expensive because it's industrial grade. Um, if you want to get into this thing, I would recommend going the Pi route or this little, I think these things are $35 from Adafruit, this little feather they're called little microcontroller, and that's got all you need to be able to mess with some of this stuff. So, um, now I'll show you some, well, before I get, to, so what we can do with something like this, which just listens but doesn't interject anything into the conversation, this is the control that we use for our Hushomatic, for example. Um, it listens on the network, and when it gets, it reads the signal from the the delay ring for the intermittent wipers. You can set the wipers to fast, medium, slow, hyperactive, whatever. It reads that signal and says, okay, I'm going to use that, pretend that it's for me, and I'm going to use it to tell me how much I should open the butterflies in the exhaust. And then it does its own thing, which lets us hijack an existing control without modifying how it works um, and have it do our own thing. And we can also have it listen for, okay, the windshield wipers are on. Let's just set the exhaust to quiet. We'll ignore the other signals. It can take anything that's in the, and it could also, you know, take into account the steering angle, for example. While the steering wheel is turned all the way, let's make the exhaust loud just because it'd be funny. I mean, that's the sort of stuff you could throw in there. Do you have any questions over there, Travis? Not that I've seen yet. Yeah, I'm kind of whapping through this in a hurry. It doesn't come across as very um, well thought out, but there you go. So one of the challenges, of course, of doing this sort of stuff is trying to figure out what these messages look like. And Travis, you come over here. General Motors is very, very thoughtful. They actually publicize as part of the General Motors uh, publication 8762. You can buy this from the SAE, and this gives you everything that is in the GM. This, this is the, the definition. This is the dictionary for, for GM's uh, CAN messages. So this tells us, for example, this is, we're looking at message 4C1. That's hexadecimal. So the, uh, it will go anything up to F on that, really, basically. That's base 16. Um, it's sent every 500 milliseconds. So this is fairly low priority as this stuff goes. You know, engine speed, for example, is sent every 12 and a half milliseconds. And it tells us stuff such as the engine coolant temperature. It's on byte 2. It's uh, 7 bits long. Or sorry, I got that backwards. I would do uh, here's the range, and here's how you convert it. So that basically, this will be a binary number that's, uh, that's a full byte, 8 bits long. Um, and you take it, multiply by 1, <laughs> and subtract 40. I don't know if the multiply by 1 was completely necessary there, GM, but there you go. And that will give you the temperature in Celsius. Same with the intake air temperature. It uses the same thing. 
outside air temperature powertrain estimated, which is an interesting one. It doesn't explain, it does explain actually early on what all these mean. This, I'm on page like 200 and something here. 259 of 300, we have gone through the discussion of how these all work. But uh, this is a very, very useful document because it means if you are trying to listen to what's going on, if you're trying to determine what's going on with a GM powertrain control module or GM CAN system, any sort, it's right here. Mazda, unfortunately, is not this forthcoming. Um, we've actually had engineers at Mazda North America say, you know what, Mazda Japan won't even tell us what these things are. So the only way to figure this out is to try to reverse engineer it. And that means doing things like opening this up and then doing something and seeing what changes. And if I was smart enough, I would have prepared something for this. But for example, what did we figure? Um, if we want 9H, are we turned on? Yeah. Oh, car's turned off. Was this the one that was the turn indicator? Yeah, see, there we go. So here we're looking at message 9A, never mind the H. Mission 9A, watch this, I'll turn on the turn indicator. That's the turn indicator light flashing. So that is the signal to flash the left hand turn signal light. If I turn, flash the right, and by, this is a hexadecimal number, by turning that into binary I can figure out which bit it is, it's getting flipped back and forth, and that will tell me if I wanted to flash that light in the dashboard, that's the message I would have to send. Does that sound tedious? Uh, yes, it can be. <laughs> um, there's a number of tools. I mean, this is basically just data analysis of what this is. You can do this with Excel. Um, I'll show you what some of this looks like on PCAN. We have figured out in this particular case what the steering angle sensor in the wheel looks like because an ND Miata has both a, it has a sensor in the rack, but it also has a sensor in the wheel on the GT models only. Go figure. Um, and this is from that, that sensor in the wheel. This is the brake pressure, which is something you're not going to get out of an OBD system. And this is the engine speed. So this is, this, is a, this is a log that we took, and this has been analyzed and lets us see what's going on. So this tells us, okay, we figured this one out. I mean, these numbers all make sense. Engine speed, obviously, this is idle. It's sitting at about 1,200 through all this. Car's not driving. If we drive it, we can see it a little more. And we can see the engine, we can see the wheel turning, um, going from zero to 400, or basically about 450 degrees on each side. And this tells us that we have managed to figure this out. And this was all done by simply doing stuff, watching the numbers, and then reverse engineering it all, which is, it's a pain in the butt. There are some people out there who have done this. Um, you know, some communities have done this. It's open source. There's errors in some of their stuff. Um, but it's a place to start. So um, if you are looking at, say, a race dash that says that it has CAN capability, or if you're looking at an ECU that has CAN capability, that basically means that that race dash or that ECU has the ability to listen to that network, but it doesn't necessarily know how to read the messages. So if you are looking at something like that, make sure that your vendor, whoever's supplying it to you, can give you a translation file, can give you a file that will tell it how to understand what engine RPM looks like from a GM or from a Miata or from whatever it is you're putting it in. If you're trying to put a race dash in you know, Maserati B Turbo or something like this that would be unlikely to have a CAN bus, but if it did, um, you would have to make sure they had that particular file or you're going to have to figure it out yourself. So simply knowing how to intercept or receive CAN signals is not the same as being able to understand CAN signals, and that's, that's an important thing. Um, one of the questions we had about this, of course, of the NCs in particular, people have been asking about this, um, is how can we basically take this over? If you want to do an engine swap, if you want to put a V8 in an NC, or an ND in this case, how do you get it all to work? And that is a matter of you need to figure out, you need to reverse engineer those messages so that you can send the ones to the dashboard, for example. The dashboard, the NC is fairly simple when it comes to CAN, but the dashboard is driven off CAN, so you know how to send it the correct information. Um, you could do that to potentially put a real oil pressure gauge in there, for example, one of the questions. You could put an oil pressure sender in the system somewhere, hooked up to a little microcontroller that can take that, turn it into the correct CAN message, and then send that to the ECU as long as you can block the factory one from getting in there as well. Not from the ECU, to the, um, you send it to the dashboard, because the factory ECU apparently doesn't care what the actual uh, oil pressure is on an NC. It's just making it up. Um, if you didn't know that, NCs don't really have a real oil pressure gauge. They simply make up a number that seems about right for the temperature and the engine speed, uh, unless it's below about seven, in which case they say, okay, it's nothing, it's zero. 
very, very helpful. Thank you, Mazda. Um, the ND, of course, is a much more complicated thing. It's got far more, it's a far more integrated platform in terms of body control modules and electrical switching modules. The NC being an older platform, um, having its base in 2003 with the RX-8, uh, is not as sophisticated as these are, but it still has a lot of the same stuff. Do we have any questions pop up there yet, Travis? You haven't seen any, any questions. I uh, unfortunately did not write down the ones that people asked me well enough. Um, oh, one question we did get quite a bit, and this is possibly because the picture that we showed on the, the, the teaser for this, one of the ways to get this can information, if you want to know exactly what information, say, the vacuum, vacuum pump on an ND is sending out, is to simply take that vacuum pump and hook a can receiver into it, and then turn it on and see what the messages are coming out are. That will tell you what the messages from that particular unit look like, how often they're sent, and then you can start to reverse engineer them. In the case of a vacuum pump, they're going to be pretty simple. In the case of a steering rack, we literally took a steering rack out of one of these cars, put it on, there we go, I'll get these. Thank you, Travis. Um, we actually took the steering rack, put it on the bench, hooked up to it, and then started doing things like messing with the, the actual input shaft and reading what it said. And that lets you isolate those and uh, figure out what those numbers are. And because we use that picture, one of the questions we've had quite a bit is, can we change the level of steering assist on the ND? And I think we can. Um, it's not something we've worked with much, uh, mostly because I don't think we realize how many people were interested in that. But Travis asked me about it before we started today. So Travis has an ND. Uh, he's not the only one of our... Uh, of our employees, Ryan has an ND, plus of course we have our own. Um, we might start looking into that. That would be a fun project to take on. I might, uh, I might do a little bit of research to see if I can bring that level of assist down. It will require a gateway. You won't be able to do it by spamming the system, I don't think, but uh, it would be an interesting little box to throw in that system. Um, okay, so here are some of the questions we've had. Uh, one is, what is the difference between CAN and pulse width modulation? And hopefully by this point, um, this person has, has figured that out, is that CAN is basically, it's a network protocol. Pulse width modulation is a way of controlling something. Um, it's effectively, it's, you know, honestly, it's, it's more or less how your injectors work. Uh, it's just on off, on off, on off, on off, and how fast you do that and for how long. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a type of signal as opposed to a networking protocol. Hopefully that helps, and hopefully I didn't just describe injectors improperly. Uh, different LT or LS comparability, Difference in factory order to pull from donors. So this is a question specifically about the messages that are being sent on the CAN network by the GM stuff. And GM being who GM is, they have their own internal standards. You want to buy that, that, um, that particular document that I was referring to earlier. Uh, GMW, what is it called again? 8762. It is not one you're going to find uh, running around loose on the internet. Um, it is, you know, it costs real money, but it has real information in it. So you can get this from the SAE, I believe. Um, so here we go. Here's a little more information on, on some of this stuff. Um, let's see. So here's, the, here's some more information on the air conditioner compressor mode request signal detail. Uh, this talks about what it is, uh, what each of the numbers mean, um, and it will get into very fine detail in each one of these things. And GM uses this as a global standard. So an LT1, an LS1, um, a donor you know, or a GM performance uh, thing will all have these messages. If they're present, they will all be the same thing. Now, some of this stuff is related to hybrid systems. Some of it's related to four-wheel drive systems. Some of it's related to cylinder deactivation. So these messages may simply not be there in some implementations. But if they're there, that's what they'll look like. So I strongly recommend, if you're going to be messing with GM stuff, buy this, buy this uh, document. Um, and please, Mazda. Just publish it. Come on. You do us all a favor. Uh, so can CAN bus help me with custom electronics in my NA Miata? Now, the NA doesn't use CAN bus inherently. There's nothing stopping you from using it for things to communicate. For example, if you put in an ECU that can speak CAN like the Hydra does, or I believe the MS3s do, um, and unlikely, quite likely more, if they can send information via CAN and you get a race dash that can receive information via CAN, you can tell those two to talk to each other, but you're probably going to have to define your own messages, or you're going to have to use messages defined by one or the other so that they agree on what a tachometer signal looks like or what a check engine light uh, signal looks like or what a coolant temperature signal looks like. So yes, you can definitely use it, but you can't 
tap into an existing network on the car already like we can on the ND because it's simply not there. Um, oh, one thing I was going to mention about race dashes is, is the difference between CAN and OBD2. Um, you see a lot of dashboards that, like the, the old uh, scan gauges, for example, um, you simply plug into the OBD2 port and you read off that and that gives you your all the stuff that we're talking about, engine speed and, uh, and all the diagnostics information as well. The difference between that information and what's being broadcast on the CAN bus, um, OBD2 often uses CAN as the actual transport protocol for this. When you plug in a reader, it's using CAN to talk to the OBD2 system, usually. There's, I think, five different options on there, but on the as it's CAN. Um, the difference is, is that most of those information for a, for a scan, scan reader are on demand. You send out a note saying, hey, I would like to know what the current status of this thing is. And it gets sent around to whatever that thing is. It hears it, it says, says, says OK, sends it back. But it's all very low priority. Diagnostics are a low priority thing for a car compared to, you know, we're sliding sideways. The wheels are at 13 degrees. We need to cut the throttle now. Um, so it's laggy. And you don't notice it in stuff like coolant temperature, which, you know, at the best, it's updated every half second anyway. But you do notice it on stuff like a fast-moving tachometer. You can see that it moves a little sluggishly, or a speedometer it might move a little slow, because that's just not really important to the car to get you that information. So if you have the choice between a, an OBD2 scan type gauge versus something that actually speaks CAN and speaks the CAN of the vehicle you're plugging into, you'll get much, much better performance out of the latter. Um, and I can't give any specific recommendations on this. I think AIM has the Mazda numbers, the Mazda information, uh, Race Pack, I think, has it as well. But definitely ask them if, they're, if they've got the actual CAN messages. Uh, personal favorite sites or literature to learn more on the topic. Um, I actually don't have a solid answer on that one, I'm afraid. Um, the reason being is I actually learned from other people uh, who taught me personally and from a lot of time spent dinking around with this thing. Um, and honestly, it's one of those things where the best thing you can l do to learn is to just try it. You know, put together yourself some sort of little CAN device using a Pi, using an Arduino. Um, I'm sure there's something you can buy off the, uh, off the shelf. Send mess you know, read some messages, look at some messages, send some messages, see what happens. We were doing that before we went live. We were trying to find a good signal we could use to show that, yes, we can insert message into the dashboard. We had stuff flickering all over the place. Um, there was stuff going all disco mode, strobe because it was interfering with, uh, with other things. As long as you don't hurt something, it's unlikely you'll hurt something. Um, what the heck? Play with it. I've always felt that the best way to learn something is to basically poke at it and see what it does. It explains a lot right there. I'd like to apologize to all my family cats. Uh, do we have any more questions there, Travis? I don't see. Okay. Well, hopefully I have covered enough to get people comfortable with the idea of what CAN is how they might be able to use it, what its limitations are. Um, it's important to notice or to note that this has nothing to do with, say, reflashes. You know, the flashing new data into an ECU, hoping that it will change the, the timing tables or the fuel tables, that's a totally different thing than CAN. The actual communication might take place over a CAN network, uh, in which case there's a signal that basically says, okay, you listen hard, I need you to receive some new programming now, but that's all a matter of what is inside the message, not the message itself, and certainly not the underlying protocol. So it's important to remember that when you're messing with the CAN system, you're not reflashing the car, you're not necessarily changing its ability, you know, not necessarily affecting its emissions. Okay, well, if you do have any questions, throw them in the comments. Uh, if you're watching this in the future on YouTube, obviously I won't be able to answer in real time, but we will try to answer any questions that throw up in the, uh, in the comments. And if anybody has any ideas for really fun, cool stuff to do, if you can listen in to everything that's going on on this chassis, everything from wheel speed to brake pressure to yaw to whether the, uh, what speed the air conditioning fan is set to, that signal's in there, um, and make it do something else, we'd love to hear it because it's always fun trying to think of what you can do. I mean, let's change the volume of the exhaust using the intermittent windshield wiper um, control. I mean, that's, that's the sort of cool stuff that I want to... I want to see more people having ideas with. We could turn on alternate lights. You could have it um, you know, control something like an intercooler mister. You could find a way to, to throw that in there to turn the intercooler mister on and off using other systems that are in there. I mean, you've got access to intake air temperature. Look at this. I'm developing a product right here. Um, you've got access to intake air temperature. You've got access to manifold pressure. Um, 
you could do a misting system. Yeah, that would actually be kind of fun. An automatic misting system that whenever it goes over a certain amount, it's Anyway, there you go. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, if you want to develop that one, go right ahead. I'm going to give that one away for free. Um, so thanks for your attention. We will uh, see you again next week with something else. And again, my name is Keith Tanner from Fly Miata. Have a good day.